be getting. You can't always. This is the death. Remarkably empty. Turn back. Towards God. Rise up. Welcome to Vital Signs, your prescription for a healthy family, where members of the Catholic Medical Association explore medical topics vital to the health of you and your family members. I'm Dr. Tom McGovern, the host of Vital Signs, brought to you by Shalom World TV. Today, we explore planning for your needs and those of your family members at the end of life. Everybody will face death, die, be buried. And that moment of death, it's the most important moment in our lives. The state of our soul at our death determines our eternal destiny. Patients near the end of life tell us that the most important things to them are being at peace with God, which includes receiving the sacraments for Catholics, and being pain-free, all while still being mentally alert. And this is a challenge because doctors are often willing to sacrifice mental clarity for pain control. So how can you best prepare for that moment of death in a way that is meaningful to you? And let others know what is important to your care when a cure is no longer possible? Part of the answer includes having a living will and knowing what is essential to include in it. The other part is designating a healthcare surrogate, someone who can make decisions for you if you become unable to make those decisions. Joining us today is Dr. Natalie Rodden, a palliative care physician practicing in Denver, Colorado. Natalie, welcome to Vital Signs. Thank you, Tom. This topic might seem odd in a show geared toward families with children at home. However, I remember when I was a young army doctor in my 20s, I had to visit the army lawyers on post and fill out forms that addressed my end of life wishes. As a young physician, I felt unprepared to do that adequately. I imagine others without the benefit of a medical education feel even less prepared. What do you think about that? I'm not surprised to hear that. I think most of us don't have much experience with thinking about death or dying or what might happen to us if something catastrophic happened to our health. And yet it's something that is so important that we take the time to talk about with our loved ones so that we do have some preparation if something, God forbid, does happen to us or someone we love. Natalie, I have never been with someone in the last hour of their life. What is that like? It truly is is something very special. I, I had a colleague once mention to me that she felt she was the last person that this patient saw before they saw Jesus. And to think about the gravity of that, about how you can love that person and accompany them and be with them during the last moments of their life on earth. And to accompany them right before that journey. And so it really is a special time to be with a patient and their family. And we we call it in palliative care or hospice work, being a midwife for the soul. So just like someone accompanies someone at the beginning of life, helping ease those labor pains and come to new birth, that's how we also think about it at the end of life. How can we accompany this person and their family to ease those pains, to to meet God. And so it really is a a gift to be a part of that time of someone's life. So Natalie, that's a beautiful way to describe it. And as you know, better than we do, none of us gets out if you're alive, we all die. So if given the choice between a bad death and a good death, we generally would choose a good death. But Natalie, what is a good death and how does our Catholic faith inform that? That's a great question. And it's one I've thought of a lot as a palliative care doctor. So just to give a little background, if you haven't heard of palliative care, it's a field of medicine, a a subspecialty that focuses on helping people who have serious illness and for those nearing the end of life. And so I work with patients and their families to help ease the suffering, side effects of their treatment and the symptoms from their disease to help relieve the stress in any way it may come about. 
So it's not only physical for many people who have severe illness, but it's also emotional stress and spiritual stress, financial stress, all those sorts of things. And so I work with a team of other professionals like social workers and chaplains to help the patient and their family have the most peace as as the patient nears nears that end of life. And so it it truly is a special time and I'm able to use my my expertise and our team is able to really work with the patient and family communicating with them on what this end of life period is going to look like for them. And so I would say a good death or a good period of life before death would be having symptoms well managed, being able to have good pain control, not being very anxious or agitated, having mental clarity, being able to spend meaningful time with their families, and also to be able to be at peace with those in their life and also peace with God. And so as Catholics, that's a very special, we have special ways that we can help prepare for this time. And I think the most obvious would be the the sacraments of healing that we have. So being able to receive the Eucharist, being able to go to confession and have anointing of the sick, being able to have a priest visit with the patient and their family are really important. And then having opportunities for prayer. I've seen some families enjoy singing songs to God together or hymns. Uh, There's so many beautiful ways that our faith helps during this period because this isn't meant to be full of sadness and suffering, but it's meant to be one of continued growth and and healing and even joy as the patient is preparing to meet God. And we're going to touch on some of those in the rest of this interview. Now, when I looked at an article you recommended to me on what patients near the end of the life found important, over 99 percent said it was important to be kept clean. And the first thing I thought of was Mother Teresa. When she brought a dying patient into one of her homes, the first thing she did was to clean them. I I wouldn't have thought of that, but the patients have. What is it about being clean that's so important to a patient near the end of life? I think being clean is is part of just feeling dignified and and having good care. I, I feel that it's a respectful way to feel that you're well taken care of by those around you. And so I think it's a way to honor a patient. And I think that it is something that patients should expect and desire. I think it's something too that if a patient, for example, is being cared for by their family, this is something that the family members can work with the care team to help to help do, to bathe the patient or to massage them, to, to give that meaningful touch to the patient, to keep them in the most comfortable, clean and safe environment they can as as they prepare for their for their last days or weeks um, on this earth. Uh, touch is so important. And boy, we've sure learned that with the pandemic. Well, the same study showed that African-Americans and other non-white ethnic groups were three times as likely as whites to agree that using all available treatments was important at the end of life. So this brings up an important distinction, and that's the question of caring for a patient versus curing them. What is the importance of caring versus curing, especially near the end of life? That's a good question. And I think it's it's sometimes tough because in our medical system today, we act as illness and death is the enemy to be defeated at all costs. And so we have developed these medical technologies that make it feel like we can conquer these illnesses. But at times, chronic illnesses aren't able to be cured or fixed. And things like dementia or heart failure or chronic lung disease or even cancer can't be fixed despite all the treatments we have and all the technology and machines that we have. And so what I like to think about with these patients and their families is how can we help you live the best life possible even if we can't fix or cure this? And so it's it's sort of reframing what I call the fight. So a lot of patients might come to me and say, Uh, Doc, I'm a fighter. I'm going to fight and I want to beat this illness. And sometimes if I know that this illness cannot be cured or completely gotten away with, I like to reframe that fight and think about, well, how can we fight? What are some things we can fight for that we can actually beat, that we can win, a fight we can win? And I think about fighting for good days, fighting for comfort, fighting for meaningful time with family members. And these are things that we can do to keep caring 
even when we can't cure. And a colleague of mine called it intensive caring because often the intensive care unit may not be the best place for this family uh, member or this this loved one, but having them in, in a supportive home or supportive environment around their loved ones and, and having care like palliative care in these situations or even hospice, these can be environments where we can very much intensively care for them in a beautiful way. And when we talk about this caring at the end of life, there's a distinction between something called ordinary and extraordinary care or what's been called disproportionate or burdensome care when the treatment's worse than the disease. What should patients know about this, Natalie? I think these are terms that before I studied them further, I was a bit confused about. And so it's good that we're bringing them up. I think traditionally, um, extraordinary care would be care that would, would seem over and abundant or care that's not necessarily necessary versus ordinary care would be basic care that every patient needs. Things like food and water, we would consider ordinary care, or things like dialysis or chemotherapy or a mechanical ventilator to help someone breathe might be considered extraordinary. The distinction can be kind of challenging, and so I think that the language of proportionate versus disproportionate is actually better to use because these terms are looking at the benefit versus burden of the treatments that are that are being evaluated. And so in the situation of, for example, dialysis, um, for some patients, it might be very much more beneficial than burdensome. But for other patients, dialysis might be considered much more burdensome than beneficial. It really depends on how this balance is looked at in the eyes of the patient. It's not about what the doctor feels. It's not about what family members feel. It's really about this patient looking at this treatment for me And is this something that is overly burdensome? And so that's tricky and something that I think people like palliative care doctors or uh, your other medical team can help you kind of discern your values and looking at a treatment or looking at a medication or some option that comes up to you medically and to determine, is this proportionate care for me? Do the benefits of this outweigh the burdens for me in my situation based on my other medical problems, based on my goals and wishes? and what my life looks like. I hope that can be helpful because that that can be a tricky distinction to make. Thanks for clarifying that that is not a cut and dried black and white decision. So what's the best way for patients ahead of time to make their wishes known for end of life care? I think one of the best ways to make your wishes known is to truly talk about it with your loved ones. And this is hard because these kind of situations are not, and these decisions are, are things that none of us want to talk about. It's not fun. But being able to have these conversations and the courage to bring them up with your loved ones is truly a gift. If you don't feel comfortable talking about it, at least documenting it is helpful. But I recommend doing both because I've been in too many situations where patients do not have their wishes listed or they haven't talked to their family about what they would want in different scenarios. And it leaves the family with a lot of questions and a lack of peace. And so I think the biggest gift you can give your loved ones is to help let them know what's important to you and how you would want your care to be handled if you couldn't speak for yourself. So I always want my patients to make their own decisions and speak for themselves. But there are certain situations that may happen where a patient is unable to. Perhaps they're on a ventilator machine, or they're really sleepy, or they're confused. Some situation comes up, God forbid, they were in an, in an accident on the highway. You know, something could happen to any of us. And so I feel it's important for every person to have a medical durable power of attorney to help make these decisions for them. Even if you're very, very healthy, it's important. I have my power of attorney listed, and I've talked to them, and I've documented it. And not only do you write out who this person is, but to give a copy of that form to your doctors, because the forms are only as helpful as as they can be followed. And so it's important that if you complete anything like advanced directives, a medical power of attorney is a type of an advanced directive. It's basically giving your doctors and your medical team advanced information that you made when you were clear of mind to think about what you would want in your health if certain situations might arise. So it sounds like that person is the most important thing to have prepared. You've talked to them. 
beforehand. What topics should you specifically discuss with that person who you would allow to make decisions for you if you're not able to? I think that the most important thing for this medical durable power of attorney to know is that they're meant to be your voice if you can't speak for yourself. So it's not about what they would want for you. It's about what you would say, what you would do, and what you would want if you couldn't speak for yourself. And so I think being clear about what you would want and say and do is very vital to have this person know. And that being said, I think it's important that you prudently discern who would be that person to speak on your behalf in the best way. And it may not be your spouse or your child because they might not emotionally be able to take that task. It's important to think about who's going to be able to be readily available to the medical team that is caring for you and who is going to be able to to be able to be calm and logically make decisions that are what you would want. And so I think sharing with them what kind of things are most important to you. What does a good death look like for you? Would you want to be on life support machines? Would you want to have a priest called to the bedside to give you anointing of the sick? All those sorts of things are important, and there are forms for a medical power of attorney and other advanced directives that are available in every state. There are forms that the state puts out, and for most places, there are Catholic-specific forms as well. And so the diocese in which you live may have advanced directives that work with your state's laws, because most states have similar, but there might be nuances that are slightly different. And so it's important to have a form in your state that you live in. Most forms will be honored by other states, but it's just the smartest thing to do. And so having these forms printed out and completed, hopefully alongside your power of attorney with you, would be wonderful things to do to have these ready in case they ever need to be used. And as Catholics, what are some things on these forms, which are sometimes called living wills, that we might want to prohibit uh, or allow? It's a little tricky because we don't always know what kind of situations we'll be in. And so saying things like, my Catholic faith is very important to me. I believe in the sanctity of life. I want to have my life uh, protected. Um, as Catholics, we don't necessarily believe life should be prolonged at all, at all costs, but we do believe that life should be protected and there's a sanctity there. There might be things like, I want to have good pain and symptom management. I wish to have adequate nutrition and hydration to be cared for. I wish to be um, supported by my family. I wish to have access to the sacraments. All these sorts of things, I think, are often present in Catholic-specific living wills. But again, even on secular state forms, you can there's places to add these these kind of things and making sure that your medical team knows that your faith and making sure that you're following um, the Catholic teachings in your medical decisions. In that study I referenced earlier, when seriously ill patients were asked to rank in order what was most important at the end of life, two things tied for number one. They were freedom from pain and being at peace with God. And just behind them was mental clarity. Now it's interesting, the doctors agreed with them on number one and two, but patients were much more likely to say having mental clarity being important, over 90%, whereas only two thirds of doctors thought so. How do we bridge this gap where some doctors seem willing to give up mental clarity for being pain free? Yeah, I think that's tricky. And that's why I I feel that a palliative care specialist could be particularly helpful to patients nearing end of life. And also communicating to your your team, if it's a hospice team or it's a, a, a team in the hospital, that having mental clarity is really important. Because I think that sometimes the medical team really is focusing on just keeping you comfortable. But at times it really is a give and take because many of the medications we use to help with pain management or to help with breathing issues, they might be kind of sedating. And so what my practice is, I like to start at the lowest dose and start very slow and work with the nursing team to help relieve symptoms, but try not to overly sedate. And I think particularly 
if the family is going to have a special gathering with the patient or the patient's looking forward to visiting with a particular person in their life. Let's try to time the dosing of medicines around that so they can have the optimal experience being with that loved one, not to give them a dose of medicine right before that person comes, for example. It really is a balance working on mental clarity and symptom management, but it's something that I think can be achievable. It's, it's kind of like an art, but that's what the team is there to help the patient and family with because different uh, patients are affected by different doses differently. And so we'll work together to make the patient as comfortable as possible, but also as clear. As our final question, especially thinking about Catholic listeners, over 90% of patients believe being at peace with God is important at the end of life, but only two thirds of their physicians think so. How can patients uh, assure as much as possible that their wishes for spiritual care will be met near the end of life? I think that mentioning these things in your advanced directives would be helpful. And I also think mentioning these wishes to your power of attorney so that the power of attorney, if you can't speak for yourself, is able to advocate for your behalf and just to advocate for yourself. Don't be afraid to share with your medical team what's most important to you because those of us in healthcare, we're here to help people. And you know, my, my goal is helping people as they're nearing end of life is to make that experience what they want it to be and to be able to be a part of that with them. And if spirituality is their top priority, I want that to be, be present. And if we need to call a priest, that's that's super important. If we want to get the family members all together, that's really important. It's it's really about each individual person. And so don't be shy to share your values with your healthcare team. Natalie, you have been a godsend and I bet you are to your patients. Thanks for taking the time to inform our viewers about vital, important things in preparing for end of life. And so listeners, please prepare those documents, naming someone to make decisions for you and uh, letting them know your wishes. Thanks for watching this episode of Vital Signs, your prescription for a healthy family, brought to you by Shalom World TV and the Catholic Medical Association, where we are inspiring physicians to imitate Jesus Christ. Please join us for our next episode and share the good news of Vital Signs with a friend, and may God bless you. I encourage everyone to send us emails with questions that you want to ask medical experts. Please email us at vitalsigns at shalomworld Org. Your questions and comments will help us determine what topics we'll cover in the next season of Vital Signs. use media a lot in evangelization. So I believe in the importance of Catholic radio, Catholic TV, Catholics using the new media. Can I encourage everyone to watch Shalom TV? I think it's a great vehicle of evangelization. And God bless all of you.